So I've been more discussing some of the philosophical reasons behind our bridge for bridge. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <sighs> okay, here we go. Hi, I'm Brittany Highland, and welcome back to our Overlanding 101 video series. Along with my husband, Eric, and our four-year-old son, Caspian, we've been traveling full-time for almost eight years, and we are now full-time Overlanders. This is our home, this is our life, and today we want to share our cooking and kitchen setup with you. It's something that can feel a little bit intimidating. You want to eat well, but it's hard to know how sometimes. So we're going to share all the tips that we've learned from our years of travel on the road with you. Let's talk about the overall flow of our whole cooking setup and how we can save ourselves extra steps in camp and make it easy. So here we have our National Luna fridge on a Goose Gear Solo fridge slide. We actually took out our two seats on this side so that we could place the fridge here right under the awning in case it's raining or there's inclement weather. We also have lighting up here from Rigid Industries if I need to cook at night. Moving over, you can see this is where my big table is with my stove. I have lots of room to stage my cooking items. If you come over here, at the rear of the vehicle, I have my Adventure Tool Company kitchen bags. I keep all my dishes in here and all my utensils. Because they're open, it's really easy to just grab whatever I need. Here in our goose gear cabinets, I have all my pantry items. And so again, it's as simple as opening the drawer and grabbing out what I need. The best that you can do is to save yourself from having to unbury items and remove lots of things just to get to the one thing that you want. How accessible are the items? Can you just reach out and grab them and continue your cooking? Or do you have to stop in the middle of your meal because something is buried and you can't find it? You'll see that we're still under the awning here, providing protection from the sun, any rain or snow. Right on the other side of this door is our trash bag. So it's really easy to access, but it's not in our clean cooking area. Oh, and before I forget, I have to show you this. We actually have a water spigot right here coming from our Alucab water tank inside. And so if I need to clean my hands or clean dishes, I turn that on and it drains right down into my dish pan to catch that water so that we don't waste it. And my dishes can soak until it's time to do dishes. One of the things I wanted to talk about was the idea or the philosophy of having a clean side of your setup and a dirty side. So some of the area that you've just seen Brittany go over, that whole area is called our clean side. So everything on the passenger side of our vehicle is designed to be kept clean. It's our living space. We don't want a lot of muck and stuff over here because this is where we live outdoors. So as Brittany mentioned, we have our fridge over here. We're covered by the awning that keeps any moisture from being on the ground. We're eating in this area. We're living in this area. And as you walk around the vehicle this way, on the opposite side of the vehicle, we have our dirty area. Let's take a look at that one next. Welcome to the dirty side of Dauntless. This is where all the dirty stuff happens. So as Brittany mentioned, right around this door here is our Blue Ridge Overland Gear extra large tire bag, basically our trash bag. And so the trash starts here, but she can just reach around from the clean side of our space to the dirty side to drop off trash. In addition, up here is where we keep our recovery gear. So if we've had to use these and I'm spraying things down or maybe some residue is still dripping off, it's all going to drip on this side again away from our living side. On the inside here, we actually have our shower handle and we're able to pull that out and use it to spray off anything we need to spray off on this side, any of our gear or equipment. In addition, normally we would have this deployed if we were going to be uh, out for an extended period of time. This is the Alucab shower cube. So when this is deployed, it creates a big box out here and we keep our toilet in there. We're able to use the toilet or take a shower. Again, all dirty side. So you're going to end up having water and mud and just debris on this side of the vehicle or on the other side of the vehicle, you don't have any of that. So I've been talking about the ideas behind our build. We've been talking about a clean side versus a dirty side. This is something that comes with experience. We've been doing this so long that we've just learned that this is a necessity and it really helps. So if you're just starting out an overlanding build, think about that as you're building it out. 
Another tip that I'd like to share is to stop buying camping gear and start buying backpacking gear. Think about it, if somebody can strap this gear to their back and climb up a mountain, then you can carry it with you. And there's certain things about it. It's gonna be lighter in weight, smaller in footprint, and arguably even more durable than your typical camping gear. And what that does is it reserves space on your vehicle, it makes your payload uh, lighter, and the stuff that you use, you're gonna be able to abuse it a little bit more. So a lot of what we carry is stuff like this which is super lightweight. So it's a sea to summit cup that can be used to hold food, can be used as a cup, it can be used as a bowl, and it, it gets down this small and narrow and it's super lightweight. So if your entire kit is built out of backpacking gear, you're gonna find that you're saving on space, you're saving on weight, and the stuff is just really durable and it's gonna last you a long time. So let's talk about a big question that new overlanders always ask. Do I really need a fridge or can I go without it? Well, the answer is you don't need a fridge. If you don't have an overlanding fridge right now, get out there. Don't make that big investment until you know what kind of travel you like. There's nothing wrong with a cooler with ice and it will allow you to have lots of wonderful explorations and still eat all the delicious things that you want to have on the road. There are some big advantages to having a fridge, and if you find that you love the overlanding lifestyle and want it to be a big part of your life, you may choose that to get a fridge, that it might make sense for you. So one of the advantages is that you don't have to get ice every couple of days. Obviously that allows you to stay out longer in nature if you want to. It saves you money in the long run. And it also saves you volume or space in your fridge because ice can take up a pretty good amount of mass in your fridge space, limiting how much food you can have in there. We're running the National Luna 50 Legacy Fridge. We love it because it's a dual control fridge. It has two compartments and you can set the temperatures separately for them. What that means is that you could have two fridge compartments, two freezer compartments, or split them, fridge and freezer. We wanna give a big thank you to Equipped Expedition Outfitters out of Salt Lake City for providing this fridge to us for our global journey around the world. Eric talked about the importance of picking kitchen gear that's light in weight and easy to store. But what about your storage solution itself? Here's what I'm talking about. Let's, let's think about this. So in our first overlanding build, we actually used reusable grocery bags to hold our pantry items. It worked, but they would fall over, they would spill. It was really hard to access what we needed. And then we had a wonderful friend build a cabinet for us made out of solid wood that was in the back of our Jeep Wrangler. It was wonderful to have drawers. It was a game changer, but that cabinet was really heavy. When we chose our Goose Gear cabinet system, we made sure to ask them the weight of each item each cabinet solution and that went into our payload spreadsheet where we were keeping track of how heavy our build was. So I just want to encourage you before you get started, if you're going to do some kind of DIY project or invest in cabinets, make sure you know how much they weigh first. One of the things that's critically important about your build, everyone wants to talk about suspension or you know, our light bars and all that kind of stuff. But the reality is in the full-time overlanding life or even just overlanding over the weekend, you spend most of your time outdoors and sitting down. And part of the camp kitchen are your chairs and your tables and how you're going to use the equipment that you have once you're actually relaxing. So my thought is make sure you take the time to invest in good chairs. They're gonna last you a long time, a good table, things that are sturdy, that can hold weight, these things are things that you shouldn't skimp on because they're going to be things that you use all the time, multiple times a day. When I first started overlanding, doing dishes was a real struggle. I just couldn't get a flow down. I couldn't figure out where things were supposed to be and what I needed to get our dishes clean. I finally figured it out and kind of just want to share it with you. I do love these collapsible dish pans. They are a good size when they're open, but they store really small. I use Sea to Summit Wilderness Wash because oftentimes we have no choice but to dump our gray water and this is better for the environment. I use a simple rag or sponge. 
And then I often found that having hot water made a huge difference, especially when it's cold outside. So at the beginning of doing dishes, I usually boil water in my jet boil, and that way I can use just a little bit and it makes a huge difference to keep my dishes clean. I have to tell you that my dishes may not be as clean by normal standards, but I can get a whole meal's worth of dishes clean just with the hot water in a jet boil. Now I have the luxury of having this spigot of cold water as well, but I don't need it. I didn't used to do dishes with it. So I have my water, I have my sponge and my soap, I clean my dishes here in the dish pan, and then the other crucial thing that I figured out is that you need to make sure you have a good spot to put your dishes to dry or until you're going to dry them. That's something I really struggled with is I didn't have a good place to put my clean dishes. Make sure you have that. Right now I'm using this fold down table with a dish towel on it and I'm just going to wash my dishes and then I'm going to lay them out here to dry and I'll come back and put them away later. We have a theme, which is start with what you have. Don't go out and get a lot of expensive gear until you know how you're going to travel. But when you've gone through that experimental phase, you have a good feel for what you want to do and it's time to start getting gear. Here's something you need to think about. Fuel sources. How many fuel sources are you going to have on your vehicle? Whatever your vehicle is, it's either gasoline or diesel. That's one fuel source right off the bat. And then when you start cooking, well, what is your stove running off of? We used to have a propane powered stove, adding another fuel source. But because we're getting ready to drive around the world and different countries have different fittings for their propane containers, we don't have any propane on our global rig. So we decided to go with this Coleman stove, which is a multi-fuel. It can run on either white gas, which you can't find everywhere in the world, or gasoline which we know we're going to have because our vehicle is running off gasoline. And so just think about that as you're choosing your kitchen setup, how many fuel sources do you have and how difficult will it be to refill that fuel wherever you want to go in the world. When we have our travels planned, it's time for me to make a meal plan and go grocery shopping. I usually go grocery shopping about two times a week is what it works out to. So I'm shopping for about four days at a time. That's just our rhythm and you can find the rhythm that works best for you. I always make sure that I have enough meal plans to cover what we have in mind as well as maybe an extra day in case we find a really cool spot and we want to stay out longer. As I'm planning our meals, here are some of the things that I keep in mind. First, how can I use the ingredients that I'm getting in multiple meals? If I'm getting an onion and I'm only going to use half of the onion for this meal, well, can I use the other half for the next meal? I also keep water use in mind. How much water is required to make the meal? And then if I'm using a lot of dishes and utensils, will I have enough water to wash those dishes afterwards? As I'm planning my meals, I'm also thinking about the space in my refrigerator. Are a lot of bulky refrigerated ingredients required to make this meal? If so, I might not have enough room in my fridge and I need to opt for something else. And finally, I'm thinking about portions and leftovers. So I usually make the right amount of food to feed our family for that meal without having a lot of leftovers, which I then have to store in the fridge and make room for. Of course, that depends what's already in the fridge. Maybe I want leftovers for later, but it's just something to keep in mind because I don't like to waste food. And so those are just some of the things that I'm thinking about as I'm planning my meals. We love to eat well. We don't usually do super complicated meals, but we also don't do just, you know, hot dogs all the time. We're eating real food that we would eat in a kitchen at home, and we love it. We can't talk about the kitchen and cooking without talking about coffee. The good news for you is that there are actually a lot of camp coffee solutions out there. This is the one that works for me. I use our jet boil flash to boil my water, and then I use an AeroPress to actually make my coffee. AeroPress makes two different products, and this is the smaller one. It has a substantially smaller footprint than the other one. I just got this at REI, and I love it. And so this is my setup, and I've actually been using it for years since we even started overlanding, and I'm really happy with it. As much as we love to eat outdoors here with Brittany cooking and Caspian running around and having a good time like that, we also love to go out to eat. 
And that's actually part of our travels. We do that to experience the local culture, the local cuisine, and it kind of helps us get involved and feel like we're part of wherever we're at. So we encourage you to eat local. Like if you are somewhere here in the United States, don't just stop at a chain. Go out to some local establishment, get to know the people who are there, find out what their story is. And internationally, we've heard some of the best stories out there and eaten some of the most amazing food. So, uh, you know, as much as, as we talk about Camp Kitchen, don't neglect eating out from time to time just to be a part of that scene and to be to be able to feel what that area is really about from your five senses, I guess is a good way to put it. We have covered a lot of ground in this video. We've talked about fridges, whether you need one. We've talked about fuel sources for stoves. We've talked about what kind of gear to buy, where to store it, water, dishwashing, and so many other things. We're so grateful that you've joined us today. Thank you for being part of our community. If you haven't already, please hit the subscribe button. We have a lot of other great videos coming in our Overlanding 101 series and many more videos to come soon after that as we head into Mexico in just a few weeks. We also encourage you to leave a comment with your questions or your tips for the community. We would love that. Again, thank you for being here and we'll see you next time.